<sighs> okay, so let's start it. Hello, my name is uh, Marcin Vilgus. For the last two years, I have been a part of the Kubernetes team, focusing primarily on auto scaling and federation. And auto scaling will be the topic of today's presentation. Let's start with a quite common office story. A DevOps person meet a software engineer at a water cooler. <laughs> and the first one asks, uh, we are closing the budget for Q2. How many nodes will you need in your newest project? And the software engineer scratches his, his head and says, well, gosh, I don't know. Or maybe if he or she runs some artificial tests and learn it for every 500 QPSs, there is a need for an additional web server. Or maybe uh, he did some analysis and estimated that four servers would probably be enough, even on spikes. But quite probable is that to be on the safe side, he will ask for five, six, maybe even seven machines. So the conversation as, uh, ends with, I need seven. Uh, the software engineer is happy. He funded off the question. He provided an estimate, which is quite random and much bigger than the real need. But hell, no one likes to be a page in the middle of the night and responsible for the downtime. And the company pays a couple times more than it's actually needed. Before this presentation, I tried to Google what is the average enterprise data utilization. I saw various numbers, depending on who and how it was counting. And I was quite surprised by the number rarely, very rarely uh, got to the level of 15%. So over-provisioning is a fact. <laughs> there are many reasons why people over-provision. Let me focus on a couple of them. First of all, it's hard to predict what the real, real traffic will be. It changes depending on time of day, day of week. There are spikes on some events like New Year or Super Bowl. It can be hard to change the deployment, or maybe not so hard, but it will require manual intervention. And nobody likes manual intervention. So in the absence of proper automation, we over-provision. But there is another way, auto-scaling. Auto-scaling is an ability of a system to automatically scale to the current needs. It's a very nice thing, which we are incorpor incorporating into Kubernetes in a couple places. I will go through these places. So first of all, we have horizontal pod autoscale, which controls the number of replicas in a deployment. Then we have cluster autoscaler, which controls the number of nodes in the cluster. And vertical pod autoscaler, which is currently being designed and which will control the amount of requested CPU and memory for a pod. Let's start with replica count and horizontal pod autoscaler. What falls into scope of horizontal autoscaling? So when autoscaling uh, replica count, we want to ensure that these replicas get a decent load. That each pod uh, that, each pod that consumes the resources in the cluster has a reason to be there. So it's not only the result of some uh, estimation that w went completely off. We also want to ensure that there is a needed redundancy. So if a machine or a pod crashes, the service will be still up and running. And we also want to operate within the quota and the budget. What does it exactly mean to maintain the decent load? Here we have an example. Four pods, uh, each running really, really high, with really, really high CPU usage. If the traffic increases, there will be no capacity within the pod to handle it. So, in this case, we would probably like to start a new pod. Then, the new pod will get the part of the traffic, and the average load on the uh, deployment will decrease. So, we will have more space for our future traffic spikes. <coughs> Here is the case where pods are not so utilized. We have five of them. They are running on 40%. One could say that 60% of resources is wasted. So why don't we remove one of the node, one of the pods? The others will take the traffic and the utilization will decrease. And the free uh, space 
after the fifth pot can be used by someone else. All in all, we want to specify the target for the load and automatically adjust the number of replica so that the, on average, the load is as close to the target as possible. Here is a sample formula that does it. It looks scary, but if you uh, look closer, it's not so complicated. It sums the usage of pods, divides it by target, rounds up, <coughs> and we are done. How does it work in practice? Imagine that we have two pods that are running at 70 and 80% of CPU. And we are specifying the target of 50%. The sum of the usage is 150. <coughs> 150 divided by uh, 50 gives free. And this is, uh, these are these free replicas that we want to have to maintain the desired load. We are talking about the usage. And what exactly the usage is? As you know, each pod can <coughs> declare how much CPU it should get, or actually its container should get. The value is used for pod scheduling. A pod requesting two CPUs will go only to a node which actually has these two CPUs free. Knowing the relation between the current CPU consumption and the declared maximum use, can, we can easily tell whether there is some capacity left in a pod or not. So if your pod requested 300 millicores and currently is consuming 200 millicores, then the usage is 66%. <coughs> And if uh, the usage goes beyond the request and consumes, let's say, 400 millicores, then the usage is 133%. And this uh, percentage is quite descriptive. Operating on the ratio instead of row values decouples HPA uh, configuration from pod definition. And once you understand it, it's quite easy to handle. OK, so I showed you some basic formula. The reality, unfortunately, is a little bit more complex. Horizontal pod autoscaler needs to take care about a couple of other important details. First of all, margins. We don't want to go from three replicas to four replicas back and back every 10 minutes, just because the traffic changes by 2%. So there is a reasonable margin around this formula. Some pods are ready, some pods are starting, and their usage is not representative for the whole population. And they should not be and they should be included into formula in a slightly different way. <coughs> in the end, some metrics may be broken or simply missing. And we should also have a special handling for sudden spikes. All in all, uh, we put a lot of logic into horizontal pot autoscaler in order to make it work really, really well for the users. Okay, how to turn it on? It's really simple. You can do it with just a single kubectl command. You specify the minimum and the maximum size of your deployment and the target CPU uh, usage. Uh, and your uh, deployment is autoscaled after this, this, uh, this command. A few words how it works under the hood. As you know, pods run on nodes. And on nodes, there is an agent called kubelet. Each kubelet gets basic metrics like CPU or memory usage from the pods and containers that are running on the node. Then, every one minute, or more often depending on your individual configuration, Hipster gets these metrics from kubelets and aggregates them and makes them available for HPA via a well-defined master metrics API. HPA uh, horizontal pod autoscaler controller periodically checks the load and adjusts the replica codes on the controlled deployments. So, for HPI, it is critical uh, that Hipster is up and running. What else is important? So, I cannot put less emphasis on this. Declare requests for pods. It's critical, not only for HPA, but without uh, requests, HPL won't work at all. Set the target well below 100%. So, to explain it, uh, I will show you what happens when you set the target to 70%. So, this green thing here is your slack. The bigger it is, the more of sudden traffic you can handle in the pod before the new HPI starter pods are up and running. So, please pay attention to it. Also, this green thing is what uh, scales up your deployment. 
you can look at it as the amount of traffic that will go to your new pods. If you set the, the target too high, you might have no ability to handle the extra traffic here. Uh, you remember that 100% uh, is uh, basically what you asked in your pod request. There may be some free uh, cycles on your machine and you may go above 100%, uh, but you should not count of it. Also, this red bar may be too small to trigger a decent scale up or any scale up uh, at all because of the margins. So if your node is fully packed, uh, and you set this type of usage, you may have real or real troubles. Also, keep your pods and not healthy. If a pod is blocked, it decreases your average usage and it may actually scale you down. For example, if one pod is at 0% and the other one is at 50 and the target is also at 50, then the deployment may scale, and then the controller may scale your deployment to just one pod. And if you are unlucky, it may uh, uh, kill the healthy pod, so you will end up with the broken pod, which is, which is bad. So use liveness proof to ensure that your pods are always up and running. There are two comments that may help you to tell what is going on with uh, your pods. First of all is kubectl top which prints the usage and memory consumption on uh, your nodes and pods. There is also kubectl describe API, which tells you here what is uh, the current level and what decisions were made uh, uh, by the horizontal pod autoscaler. So you can understand uh, it mechanics better. CPU is not perfect for everyone. Some workloads are better scaled based on custom metrics. With 1.6, we are adding a support for custom metrics in HPI that will hopefully show its full potential in 1.7. So stay tuned and take a look at this uh, custom metrics in 1.6. Also, make sure that your requests are short and well load balanced between pods. Otherwise, the new pods won't take the load and the load will remain on the old pods. Enough for HPA. Let's focus a little bit on the number of nodes in the cluster. Setting the proper number of nodes in the cluster is quite complex. It's almost a philosophical problem. So all pods <laughs> should have a place to live. Pods are created and deleted, so the need for the node changes in time. Uh, as we uh, dis uh, discussed in a moment ago, there is horizontal pod autoscaler, which is exactly about changing the number of pods. Node uh, count should follow uh, HPI activity. If there is a need for new pods to handle the traffic, the node count may have to be increased so that the HPA controlled pods have the place to run. So the node count good for now may be bad for tomorrow or maybe even in one hour or 10 minutes. <laughs> mm, nodes are expensive. You pay for them on your cloud providers. Uh, so s being spent thrift is bad. On the other hand, pods are important. They earn you money. They run your business. So being stingy with them is also bad. So, as you can see, it's a complex problem. And to handle this problem, especially at a larger scale, proper automation is needed. But what should it look like? Simplifying a bit, pods are scheduled based on their declared resource request. If there is enough resources on a node, a pod can be scheduled. Like this green one over here. It can be placed on the node with a small yellow pot. However, if all of the nodes are kind of busy, then we don't have a place to put the green pot. So a new node should be provided and the green pot will go there. 
And sometimes there is too many resources in your cluster. For example, the node number three and number five have little utilization. They have only these uh, small yellow and green pods. We could move the green pod from num uh, node number five to node number three. And then the last node would be empty and could be removed. And that's exactly what cluster autoscaler does. It tries to add nodes when they're, they are needed and remove them when they are not so needed anymore, possibly reshuffling the pods a bit. Let's take a look at the overall architecture. Uh, so cluster uh, autoscaler runs in a separate pod, usually on the master node. It maintains API server watches on all nodes and all pods in the cluster. It talks to your cloud provider you are running your cluster on. It doesn't use any metrics, contrary to horizontal pod autoscaler, like I know current CPU load or whatever. It just focuses on the API objects inside of the API server, like pods and nodes, and their current state. Nodes in cluster autoscaler are evaluated in node groups. There is an assumption that all nodes inside of a single node group uh, are similar, or they look more or less the same. So on Google, it operates on managed instance group, on AWS, on autoscaling group, and so on. <coughs> I will explain this assumption of uh, similar nodes in, in a moment. So how does it work? Inside of cluster autoscaler, there is a loop that periodically <coughs> executes a series of checks and actions. First of all, it checks whether the uh, cluster is in a good overall state. If half of the nodes are broken, then obviously something is terribly wrong with the cluster. Like for example, you are facing a network partition. And cluster autoscaler should pause, not to make the situation even worse. However, if there is just one unready node, then it should be uh, able to continue operation. In previous version of Kubernetes, this wasn't true. Uh, the cluster autoscaler was stopping once there was a single broken node. With 1.6, we are uh, lifting this constraint, and cluster autoscaler will try to do its best, even if there are unready nodes. Cluster autoscaler may even heal and remove the uh, broken nodes on your way. So it's kind of like a <coughs> healer, so healing solution. Then after checking the cluster state, it looks for unschedulable pods. Unschedulable pods are pods for which the Kubernetes scheduler, scheduler failed to find a place for them and mark them uh, accordingly. If there are unschedulable pods, then cluster autoscaler runs a series of simulations to check which node group in the cluster, if expanded, could accommodate some of the pending pods. So it is important here that uh, the new nodes will look similar uh, to the nodes that are already there. Cluster autoscaler looks at the existing nodes and tries to guess what would the new node look like. And it assumes that it will be similar to the existing one. If there is such a node group, that could be expanded, it increases its size so that the pending pods will get a place to live. Okay, so sometimes we are not scaling up, so maybe we could uh, remove some nodes and still have, after maybe some interruption, all pods up and running. So we are checking how much the nodes are utilized and which can be removed. And if th such nodes could be removed for long enough, then we removed one of them. And the whole loop repeats. Getting uh, to some details, especially I will try to explain what the unneeded nodes are. So what does exactly mean that the node is unneeded? <coughs> According to current heuris heuristic, a node can be considered unneeded if its utilization is below 50% both in terms of CPU and memory. We don't want to harass well-utilized nodes just to get a little bit better pod packing. We check uh, if all of the pods running on the node can be moved elsewhere. This basically means that all pods 
are either backed by a replica set deployment job or stateful set, or they are run by default on the node, either via manifest or a daemon set. We don't want to create a serious issue uh, with the, the system infrastructure, so we don't touch cube uh, system pods. That means that we won't kill a node with hipster or DNS <coughs> running on it, which, on the other hand, may lead to some resource waste. In the end, nodes with local storage. Local storage uh, with pods with local storage. Local storage would be lost if the pod is killed. So it would be <coughs> bad, and we don't touch nodes with such pods. And when uh, we kill a node, first of all, we make sure that the node is not needed for at least 10 minutes. We constantly run checks and mm, do the simulation whether the node can be moved and where would the pod go. And if the simulation are successful for uh, 10 minutes, then the node can be removed and we remove one of the nodes. Of course, we do it uh, on if we haven't do uh, any scale up recently. We don't want to go up and down constantly. Uh, what else is included in the node killing process? First of all, pod disruption budget is used. Pod disruption budget were introduced in 1.5 and they got a little bit more love in <coughs> 1.6. So they are an effective way to tell cluster autoscaler not to touch some of the pods or to remove them from nodes slowly, one pod after another. Cluster autoscaler, uh, since uh, Kubernetes 1.6, respect also graceful uh, termination. We honor it up to one minute. So we give a pod a chance to finish their work uh, gracefully before uh, we kill the node. And we all allow controllers to recreate them. Uh, we remove the node on uh, the cluster uh, cloud provider side. So this information goes to Kubernetes from the cloud provider side. So the node is deleted, and then node controllers pick this information from the cloud provider. We do kill empty nodes in bulk. We may kill up to 10 nodes at the same time. But if the nodes are not empty, we kill them one after another to make uh, pod migration a little bit more stable and don't uh, create a too big mess. OK, so what are the best uh, practices of running cluster autoscaler in your cluster? First of all, do not modify nodes manually. As I said, a cluster autoscaler assumes that all nodes in a node group look the same. They have uh, the same CPU, they have the same set of labels, and so on and so on. Uh, they, uh, and uh, if the node group expanded, we expect the new node to look more or less the same and host the same uh, daemon set and manifest run pods as the nodes that are currently in the cluster. So please pay attention to that. Otherwise, the, cl the behavior of cluster autoscaler may be, may be broken. The same as with horizontal pod autoscaler, please, please declare requests for pods. They are also needed here. Regular pods without requests won't trigger cluster auto autoscaler because they can be go to any node. Use pod disruption budget to tell that you don't want some pods to be interrupted. <laughs> Cluster autoscaler can work with nodes uh, with multiple shapes and sizes. However, it is currently in beta and it works best if the cluster is kind of homogeneous. It works with heterogeneous cluster, but the experience is better with homogeneous. This thing is likely to improve in the future, but for now, uh, please uh, remember it. In Kubernetes 1.6, there are uh, two comments that might help you to tell what is the current status of cluster autoscaler. First of all, there is a config map that can be uh, accessed with a simple uh, kubectl command. In this co uh, config map, we store the information about the 
uh, current state of cluster autoscaler and information about what actions are currently being used. There is also information about whether there are some nodes that could be possibly uh, removed in the near future. Also, cluster autoscaler published events. Events go to either pods or nodes if they are directly connected to them or to this particular config map that I uh, showed to you if the event is more about the whole state of the cluster. So please check them if you feel that something wrong is going on around uh, the number of nodes in your cluster. They may help. So what is the uh, overall status of cluster autoscaler? As I said, it is still in beta. And beta in Kubernetes means that the most of the core functionality is in place. But there might be some cases when the behavior uh, or the experience is suboptimal. So what is missing in Cluster Autoscaler? So one of the things is uh, C, uh, Cluster Autoscaler Friendly Scheduler. With Cluster Autoscaler, we try to pack nodes uh, as tightly as possible. And the default Cluster uh, Scheduler tries to do a completely opposite thing. So it tries to spread the load uh, across uh, the cluster and put the pods on nodes which are less utilized. So it competes a little bit. We are hoping to introduce some more friendly uh, scheduler settings soon. Then we, uh, the configuration of cluster autoscaler depends on cloud provider. On GKE, it is a single gcloud command. On GCE, it is based on QBAP uh, script and environment variables. There is also a support for cluster autoscaler in KOps for AWS and so on. All in all, it's not super consistent and convenient, maybe except the GKE, but we are working on making it a little bit uh, easier and smoother for you. We also need more tests for non-trivial failure scenario. Cluster Autoscaler has to make a lot of assumptions about how the Kubernetes works under the hood uh, and what can possibly happen during the, its operation. We want to cover it all in the uh, continuous integration test for the uh, Cluster Autoscaler, so it is rock solid. We run manual tests, but they don't uh, show occasional issues, like the one with uh, new pods and networking found at the very last minute before 1.6 release, and uh, which forced us to ask you guys uh, uh, to wait until 1.6.1, which should be uh, in one week, before you uh, try to run Cluster Autoscaler then. It's not terribly broken, but the experience may be a little bit suboptimal. <laughs> we don't want to, uh, this to happen ever again. So we want to introduce a better uh, test there. Also, this... Uh, uh, the config map uh, thing with the status is a little bit of a hack. Uh, we are hoping that in next release there will be something called component status and the status of cluster autoscaler will migrate there. And in the end, we want to hear from you. Please try it and let us know if it worked for you or not and what were your impressions. Also, we uh, invite you to contribute to Cluster Autoscaler. We are slowly running uh, uh, out of time, so just a few words of the upcoming <coughs> vertical pod autoscaling. Its goal is to automatically set and update uh, container requests based on the previous use. So if your pod is using a lot of memory and crashes, for example, with out of memory exceptions, we'll try to get it more memory. If a pod that is if there is a pod that actually is not using the declared uh, free CPUs, but rather one and a bit, uh, then we will try to reduce the request CPU so uh, the resources in your cluster are better utilized, and so on and so on. Des the design for it is almost completed, and we hope to have some proof of concept alpha version around the June. Anyway. If you are interested in VPA or any of the cluster autos uh, any of the autoscaling efforts, please join us on our weekly Seek autoscaling uh, meetings. They take place on Thursday, 5:30 p.m. Berlin time, which is 8:30 Pacific Standard Time. 
Okay, and we have, I believe, five minutes for questions. <laughs>